Hello students, we are here once again in our discussion about the contemporary world. And I am here, I am Sam Cairo Carrillo de Manlev, your teacher for the contemporary world. Let's start our discussion. So for our discussion, this um, topic is about the global interstate system. What does it mean by global interstate system? When we are talking about global interstate system, we have already discussed about the economic globalization that is happening to the modern world or to the contemporary world, which is the modern world system on how economic capital and the consumption of goods is transferred from one state to the other state. However, here in the global interstate system, let's try to analyze the political globalization. So, in discussing the global interstate system, we have to discuss the political globalization. What does it mean by political globalization? Political globalization is the amount of political cooperation there between countries. Meaning to say, this is, this is the test or this is how, how countries or states or even nations cooperate with each other for a common good? Or how could they communicate for the economy? How could they communicate for their socialization? That's political globalization. It means about cooperation. So there are four key attributes for world politics. To better understand the global interstate system, we have, to, we have to affirm on these four key attributes in the world politics. First is that there are states that are independent from each other. Take note of it. There are independent with each other since, since these states are very unique and thus these states can stand on its own. They have the, these unique characteristics like these states can stand because of their stable economy. The other states can stand because they have these raw resources which can be manipulated by strong states. Those, those are independent from each other. No one can hamper their independence because they can stand on its own. Next attribute is that these states interact with one another through diplomacy. The friendship, like any other things, like us human beings, we call or we interact with each other and we call, it, we call ourselves as friends. However, in the world politics and thus in the global interstate system, in that system alone, in that system alone, we could say that their friendship is called diplomacy. They interact in a diplomatic way. They don't, really, they don't get engaged with wars easily. However, they interact through a diplomatic way. Diplomats, these are well-versed, responsible of their own actions. That's diplomacy. Next attribute is international organization exists to facilitate these interactions. Take note, as what we have discussed, as what we have discussed, we have discussed that international organizations exist as part of the structures of globalization. Thus, the global interstate system is also part of the um, structure of globalization. Thus, here in the, in the global interstate system, international organizations exist to facilitate their interaction. Yes, they have already the diplomacy that we call it, and thus who facilitate the diplomatic relations among these states or these countries. Thus, the facilitator, the mediator, and the negotiator of this one are international organizations. As we have called it, international organizations is ready to become the bridge of one state to the other state. That's it, that's their interaction. And lastly, to take note about the global interstate system is that the attribute that beyond facilitating meeting among these states, these international organizations also take lives on their own. Aside from being the bridge, being the facilitator, they, take, they have their own lives, they have their own char character, they have their own entity, they have their own persona. They can stand on its own like any other states, right? 
like UN, it is a supranational organization that can stand on its own, like NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, who facilitates, who facilitates um, North American countries on their treaties and agreements, like their military agreements. So those were just a few attributes that we could affirm about full, um, global interstate system. Thus, as we discuss global interstate system, let us take note that this is part of the structures of globalization. That this structure mainly part because of its political globalization, because it's the drive through towards political globalization. Now let's go over with this one. In discussing the global interstate system, it is best to understand what is the difference between state versus nation? Because sometimes we interchangeably use these terms as being synonymous with each other. However, there is a big difference when we are talking about state or and nation. When we are talking about when we are talking about state, it's a political term. Okay, take note, when we are talking about state, it's a political term. Thus, when we are also talking about it, it has four essential elements that these elements could not, or if one of these elements will, is not present, therefore a state cannot exist. Okay, so these are the four essential elements. First is the people, territory, government, and its sovereignty. What does it mean by people? When we are talking about people, these are your inhabitants. Inhabitants living. Inhabitants living within the state. These are the inhabitants. Like us, we are the people. We are the inhabitants of this um, state. Next part is your territory. What does it mean by territory? It includes only a fixed only a fixed proportion, a fixed proportion of land over the jurisdiction of the state. So we need to say, this is our territory as a state. The Philippines, the archipelagic, um, archipelagic landscape of the Philippines is our territory. Thus, there is a question. Is there an is there a requirement? Is there a requirement that is needed? for for a place or a, a place or a specific land to become a state even though it is small or it's large is there a requirement the answer is no there is no requirement territorial requirement as long as the territory can suffice or can feed the people on its jurisdiction Again, there is no specific, like, if it is small, it's good, as long as, even though it's small, it's good, as long as this territory can suffice the needs of its people. We can grow crops, we can grow food on this one, and that's okay. Next up is the government. What is the government? This is the agency through which the will of the state is formulated. We need to say the will or the need of the state, the need of the state is um, translated or formulated. This is the agency, like us, and who led the government? The people. Thus, the people is the government alone. So this is the agency. Next one is sovereignty. Sovereignty, sovereignty, okay, sorry. Sovereignty is is the term may be defined as the supreme power of the state, meaning to say this is the power of the state. Even though you have a people, even though you have a territory, and you have an agency, which is the government, but you don't have the power, therefore you don't exist as a state. So this is the supreme power. This is the power given to a state. This is the supreme power given to a state by whom? By the family of nations. Thus, state, State is, sovereignty comprises of two types, two types of sovereignty. First is the in, internal sovereignty, and the second part is external sovereignty. 
from the word itself, internal sovereignty, meant to say this is the power, this is the power of the state to control and to command its people within its territory. Thus, the other one is external sovereignty from the word itself, external, meaning to say this is the power of the, of the state to interact from one state to, the, to others. So that is sovereignty. Thus, sovereignty also called as the independence. Independence rise when, when we can stand on our own. And that is what we call as our sovereignty. Sometimes it's called independence. Now, another feature about state is that it does not exist if one element is lacking. As I have told you, if these four elements exist, therefore state exists. But if one element does not um, on there, like for example, there's no sovereignty or even government existing, therefore state does not exist. A good example of this one is Philippines, United States, Great Britain. These are countries or these are states that we could call states, right? Okay. And going back to the sovereignty, um, let's try to discuss it one later. Now, let's go to nation. What does it mean by nation? Comparing to state, nation is a political, is an ethnic term. Well, state is a political term. It's an ethnic term. Therefore, it is a shared common characteristics, like the characteristics that you share, like you have the same history or origin. You have the same culture. You have the same religion. You have the same language. Therefore, you can be called as a nation. Regardless if this characteristics exist or not, but you have one, like for example, you only have one history then therefore you can you can be called as a nation consists of many states it's not it's not like like the state alone the state alone that it's only one but nation is consists of many states a very good example is american nation european nation arab nation so example of this one is this one the first um the first Americans, these are the Indians, the Indians, the one that we call one, little, two, little, three, little Indians. These are the first Americans. They are composed of different nations. A very good example, another example is ASEAN nation. ASEAN nation, the Asia, we are, Philippines is part of ASEAN nation because we belong to one origin and that is, one, and that is we are from the Malayan race and we belong also to um, one continent, which is Asia. That's, that's why we call it as ASEAN nation, right? And another term to be used is the combination of the two. And we called it as a nation state. This is where a cultural group or a nation, and it is also a state and maybe in addition be a sovereign state. So. So this is, this is how we define nation state. Philippines is a nation state. America, United States of America is a nation state because it's a melting pot. It's a melting pot of American races, which is they have the common cultural group. Thus, they also belong to, they have also a sovereign right and it has four elements of a state. That's why it's called the nation state. So, to further understand what's the difference between state and nation, its elements and its characteristics, I have here an example to best examine, to best examine what's the difference of this one. Because it's better to understand that the global interstate system must be first have labels. Take note, you should know what's your label. Because if you don't know what's your label, therefore you cannot, and you cannot interact in the globalization world or in the contemporary world. So let's have it here. As you can see, this is, this picture is a picture from Rome, Rome, Italy. Can we consider Rome as a state or a nation? What do you think? So let's try to analyze the four essential elements of a state, right? 
Can we consider Rome as a state? Let's try to analyze the four essential elements. First is, this is the Vatican City, okay? This is commonly the Vatican City. Can we consider Vatican City? Let's try to analyze this essential element. So let's try to people. As of 2020, it has a population of 801 people, according to the latest estimates from the UN's world population, population prospects. Do we have any requirement? Do we have any requirement according to international law that there should be um, there should be there should be this amount of people comprises for a state? The answer is no, right? As long as these people can multiply and thus we thus they can formulate their own government. This is the people. So, therefore, the one people as an element of the state exists. Next stop is territory. Considering that Vatican is only a city of Rome in Italy, it has an area outside the boundary of Western Rome of only 0 0.7 square mile or 0 0.44 square kilometer. It would only fit a Rizal Park in Manila. So again, let's try to, uh, let's try to go back to the definition of the territory. Is there, is there a specific is there a specific um, rules or guidelines of a specific territory? No, as long as they can suffice the needs of its people. Even though it's small, it still exists as a territory. Now let's go to the government. Is Vatican City has a government? Yes, it has. It is governed in an absolute monarchy with the Pope as the head of its government. And Vatican means its own euros. Take note, it has, it, they have their own money system, print its own stamps, and issues passports and license plates. So they have their own and operates media outlets and it has its own flag and anthem. Therefore, they exist. They have their own government. So therefore, it exists. For the four elements, we have only we are we have three of it. Now let's go to the last part, sovereignty. Is Vatican City has a sovereignty or the supreme power or the independence? Let's try to look for its internal sovereignty. Yes, it has internal sovereignty because it was created in 1929 to provide a territorial identity for the Holy See in Rome. They have already been recognized that they can exist on their own internally. So they have their sovereignty internal. Now let's go to the external sovereignty. The state of Vatican City is recognized as the national territory under the international law. So therefore, Vatican City has external sovereignty because it's recognized. Who recognized, by the way, the sovereignty? It is recognized by the family, family of nations. Therefore, sovereignty here, sovereignty, external sovereignty exists. So therefore, Vatican has its own sovereignty. Thus, Vatican completed the four essential elements of the state. Therefore, Vatican can be considered as a state, even though it is a city. Now, let's try to look at this another example. This is Taiwan. Taiwan. Can we consider Taiwan as a state? Now, let's go back to the four essential elements. First is people. Taiwan has, Taiwan 2020 population is estimated at 23,816,775 people at mid-year according to the United Nations data. Bigger than, bigger than Vatican City. Therefore, they could exist. Territory. The main island of Taiwan has an area of 35,808 square kilometers 
so bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger than Taiwan, bigger than bigger than Vatican City. So therefore, they could exist because they have their own territory. Now, do they have their government? They're, yes, they have their own government. They have a multi-party democracy with a semi-presidential system under People's Republic of China. Taiwan's political system has some of traits of federal system like United States. So therefore, they have their own government. They can exist, right? Now, the very much crucial, do they have their own sovereignty? Let's try to look at their internal sovereignty. Taiwan's sovereignty belongs to China, even though they have their own government. But who controls the internal, internal, internal affairs is China. Therefore, they don't have their internal sovereignty. Now let's try to do external sovereignty. China also claims Taiwan as part of its territory and denies that Taiwan is a sovereign state. China is adam, adam, adamant about preventing recognition of Taiwan as a sovereign state and its membership to the United Nations system. Therefore, even, even the um, family of nations doesn't recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state. So there is no external sovereignty. And therefore, Taiwan it has no sovereignty. So. Going back to the rules, if one essential element of a state does not exist, therefore it is not considered as a state. So Taiwan is not a state. Okay? Okay. In the global interstate system, in the political globalization that is happening to the world, there are effects of globalization in the government as we have discussed. So let's go with the effects of the government, effects of globalization on the government. Let us try to look at this one. Let's try to first discuss about, about the positive effects according to Muhammad Abu Ghazle in 2001, that globalization's positive effect is first in communication. We have the discovery of the internet and thus remarkable, it is remarkable of the heights of the number of users, number of users and subscribers of the internet. As, as we all know that communications, communications today is on our tip of our hands, right? Next up is education. Education today has an easy access of ideas and information from best libraries around the globe. That education is like communication is on the tip of our hands. We can now we can now create our own classroom virtually, and that is what we call online classes, as we are doing today. So that's education. Next stop is media coverage. We are now, we are media are now very powerful because we can now, we can now grasp or we can now get and we are now aware with issues, not just on our communities, but for the, Philipp for the whole Philippines or your country as a whole, or even um, parts of the globe, or even from outside of the countries, we can know what are their, their status regarding with their health issues, gender, environment, or in inequality. These are the positive effects in terms of media coverage. Next up is culture. We tend to, we tend to um, emphatic and we tend to be sympathetic on others' culture because like media coverage, we are become aware with, uh, with each other's culture and heritage, right? Better understanding of the culture and our resources. We become growing in the interdependence among countries as countries need natural and human resources and capital. Take note that resources comes from different countries. Therefore, we become interdependent. We rely from other countries as we go back with the modern world system. How could we give how our raw materials be transformed from the periphery, semi-periphery to the core? 
So that's our resources. Now, through our investments, our investments become large and our investments thus go beyond the boundaries of our countries. So there are a lot of investment and, lot, and thus foreign exchange and foreign entities are coming to our countries to invest. And this creates more jobs, more profits, and more capital to our, to our country and thus boost our economy. And then lastly is competition. The competition becomes global and local corporations improve their products and services because they compete globally, right? So we improved our, our simple books, our simple, our simple pens, our simple phones. We tend to improvise and create this one so that we could compete globally with the global competition becomes high. Therefore, our economy becomes more active and driven towards the betterment of each countries and states. So those were positive effects. However, Gazle also identified negative effects. First is culture, because it challenged it challenge and culture to the culture and language, which is language wipes out and reshapes the sense of identity of many individuals, especially the migrants. We tend to change our identity just like our language, as Gazle identified, language as being one of the indicators that the negative effects have changed the culture. Like we change our identity, identity because of our foreign influence, like our fashion today. Here in the Philippines, we tend to change our fashion because we tend to adopt from the Western fashion or even on the Korean fashion because that's the trend now, and that's the effect of globalization, the vanishing of one culture of a country. Next is developing countries. Corporations have tendency to cause damage to the environment and the global pillage instead of global village. If you could still recall that Canada dumped their garbages here in our country, that's the sign of how, how these um, how these um, countries, developed countries, try to bully us. They tend to, they tend to pillage our own, our own countries instead of creating global village. It widens the gap between rich and poor. Yes, we, we all know that there is a positive effect, effects of globalization, however, the rich becomes richer and the poor becomes poorer if we don't strive as a nation. That's why it widens the gap. Next is religion. Religious values lose their influence on people's behavior due to the promotion of pure secular values and the liberation of thoughts. That's why religion as part of the culture tends to become, um, to, to become not visible because we tend to adopt with other, with other liberation thoughts. Lastly, morals. Morals, people wasting a lot of time on internet for unnecessary purposes. Unnecessary purposes. Due to lack of parental guidance, a lot of criminalities have emerged in the present times. Morals tend, because we advance ourselves, family, we tend to, to vanish the family system and criminalities arise when these kids, this youth are not been, um, not been guided or even been taught of what is right and wrong. Next up is international politics. Countries have individualistic and tries to defend their own national interests and globally. Yes, we claim that we have interdependence among states. However, due to the negative effects of globalization, the politics within the international realm or the international arena have become high and they defend, they try to defend their own national interests. Next one is economy. Economy in which countries' economies collapse due to the emergence of global corporations 
that offer cheaper products and services, the emergence of electronic trade and online businesses. Because of the advancement of technology and thus the creation of globalization, we tend to, um, we tend to, um, we tend to adopt with a new world. Like for example, in the United States, some of the factories or even some of the stores were closed because everything goes online. Everything goes online. And then just a tip and just a click of your hands, you can now order your favorite food, your clothes, your shoes, and everything online. You are you are not you will not go to the physical store, but you just but just by the by the use of your phone, you can now buy online. And some of the corporations cannot compete on it, this one. Like for example, the Forever 21. Forever 21 as a fashion outlets tend not tend to close their branches around the globe because they cannot compete with the emerging um, competitions online. Last stop is science. The new scientific revolutions in many fields, the geni genetically modified organisms or GMO and cloning emerged. We have advanced and thus cloning, cloning is making like, for example, maybe sooner or later or years from now, we could have, we could have doppelganger. We have cloned. We are cloned by someone or by a scientist. Okay? So those were just some of the negative effects of globalization. Now, let us, in the global interstate system, it's better to understand what's the difference of internationalism and globalism. Now, first, what is internationalism? Nations decide to cooperate with one another in political, economic, and cultural aspects for promotion of common good. So that's internationalism. While globalism, globalism, globalism is the belief that people, goods, and information ought to be able to cross national borders freely. It is the attitude of putting the interests of the entire world above the interests of individual nations. So, there are two types of internationalism. There is an hegemonic internationalism, liberal internationalism, revolutionary internationalism, socialist internationalism. And there are types of globalism economic globalism, environmental globalism, military globalism, social and cultural globalism. So here, what's the difference between internationalism and globalism? As you can see, internationalism is on the scale of nations decide to cooperate, while globalism is the interest of the individual. Meaning to say, internationalism is the scale of what is for the common good, while globalism is the, the scale of the individual nations. It's being individualistic. Now let's try to discuss about the types of internationalism. There are four types of internationalism. Let's start with hegemonic internationalism. The dominance of one country over a nation or state, or we call it as hegemons. Hegemons or this are kaning pabida-bida, or this are the ruler of the world. As you can see here on the picture, this is Superman and Captain America, which was made by the United States to impose to us that they are the Captain America. They are the Superman. They are the superhero that can protect us in the whole world. That's hegemonic. However, now China is trying to become the hegemonic in terms of economy. Now let's call, let's call about liberal internationalism. When I say liberal internationalism, 
Nation states should give some of their freedoms, some of their sovereignty, their power, and establish a continuously growing global system, working together to prevent lawlessness in the world. Or to prevent what? To prevent Nazis to create again. Or to prevent um, World War I or World War II. That's why countries have liberal internationalism. We give our powers and we create we create organizations such as UN, ASEAN, and the European Union. Next one is revolutionary internationalism, of which conflict in the society are due to international factors and alliances. As you can see, this is the great Adolf Hitler of the Nazis, who initiated the World War II and thus lose a lot of lives. He was considered the greatest antagonist of the world history. So, it, conflict in the society are due to international factors. Like for example, due to the creation of the alliances of the Nazis, the Axis versus the Allied powers, we created World War II. Next one is the socialist internationalism of which working class nation unite to protect themselves against exploits, abuses, and oppressions done by the capitalist class. As you can see, due to socialist internationalism, we have already created social classes like we have the lower class, the middle class, and the upper class. However, there is a, there is and there is um, working classes of which they try to um, eradicate or erase the exploitations and abuses committed by the capitalist classes, right? Next up, dimension of global, dimensions of globalism. We've already discussed about internationalism. Internationalism. Now let's go to globalism. There are also four dimensions of globalism. First is economic global globalism. The long distance flows of goods, services, capital, and information that accompany market exchange. Meaning to say that these economic global globalism are now going, going easier as we um, as we as we connect more bridges and making more bridges for these goods and services, right? Next up is environment. The distant transportation of materials in aerial, fluvial, and terrestrial aspects. Environmental globalism tend to change the landscape since we created different transportations and we could easily go from one place to the other place with just a which is a ride, right? It's not like before that we tend to go to go for Cebu for a day just to ride in a boat, but we could ride um, a plane just for an hour and we are on our destinations like Cebu City. So that's the environmental globalism. Now, military globalism, the long distance networks in which force and the threat or compromise of force is deployed. Military globalism is very rampant today because military globalism is, is very rampant because the more military equipment, the, the stronger military you are, the powerful country you are. That's why the picture depicts here that China and, and, and US is trying to compete militarily because they want to prove that they are who they are becomes the hegemons, the most powerful country in the world today. Now, lastly, is the social globalism, social and cultural globalism. The movement of information, ideas, images, and people who carries this people themselves. We tried to change already the landscape, like here, the K-pop that we are doing, the K-pop, the original K-pop, the Blackpink, of course, the Girls' Generation, the Dynamite, and the other K-pop organization, of course, who would have thought to anyone, right? So that's it. That's, that's 
the global interstate system. We have already discussed how political and social, um, social, how political globalization have shaped the contemporary world. So that's it, everyone. If you have questions, feel free to comment down below. If you have comments, still comment down below. If you have questions, feel free to ask and don't hesitate to correct if I have mistakenly discussed something. Thank you so much. I hope you have learned something and stay safe and God bless everyone. Bye.